More remembrance programmes still to come here on BBC Four as David Reynolds casts a strategic eye over the last events of the First World War in Armistice next. You know, you, your hope is that he's going to come back in that door just one, one more time and say, I'm back, and storm up the stairs. But, I mean, reality knows that he won't be. BBC Two honours the fallen, Saturday at five past nine. Now, on BBC Four, 90 years since the war to end all wars finally came to a halt, David Reynolds looks back at the events around the armistice and investigates the strategic causes behind the collapse of the German forces. What does Armistice Day, the 11th of November 1918, mean to you? You may think of the two-minute silence that marks the moment when the guns stopped at 11 o'clock. You might imagine fields of poppies, tommies in the mud, tragic poets and poignant last letters home, the corner of a foreign field that is forever England. These images are etched deep in the British national memory. But this film tells a less familiar story about the Great War's bitter endgame. And so it had all been in vain. A perspective that is crucial to understanding the 20th century. All the sacrifices and privations. What happened to the other side, the Germans? The hunger and thirst, the death of two million. Blinded by a gas attack, a young German army corporal had listened from his hospital bed with helpless fury to reports of what was happening to his country. Was this the meaning of the sacrifice which the German mother made for the fatherland? For this corporal, and most Germans, the 11th of November was not the long-awaited day of victory and peace but a humiliating surrender forced on Germany by revolution at home. The armistice was a moment of national shame, the roots of another war. I, for my part, decided to go into politics. The embittered corporal was Adolf Hitler. And his shock was understandable. In March 1918, Germany had nearly triumphed. But by November, it had lost the war and the country had fallen apart. The central character in this almost Wagnerian drama was Germany's military dictator, Erich Ludendorff. His will drove the Reich towards victory. His loss of nerve brought Germany to its knees. Ludendorff then blamed the German collapse on a stab in the back by socialists and communists, the big lie that would fuel Hitler's eventual rise to power. This film tells the real story of how, after repeated attempts from 1914 to grab total victory, Germany plunged in 1918 to total defeat. Historians and journalists like to explain why wars start. But endings are equally important. How one war ends can help explain why the next war breaks out. The War of 1914-18 was supposed to be the war to end all wars. But in its ending, it sowed the seeds of an even more appalling conflict just two decades later. If we want to understand that larger tragedy, 
I believe we need to unravel the extraordinary story of the armistice. Our story begins and ends in a railway carriage. In fact, probably the most celebrated rail car in the history of Europe. Here, in the early hours of the 11th of November, 1918, the Germans sat down with the Allies to sign an armistice. An armistice is usually just an agreement to stop fighting to create a breathing space in which a peace treaty can be negotiated. But the armistice of 1918 went a lot further. The terms included not only evacuating all Germany's conquests in France and Belgium, but also allowing the Allied armies to occupy Germany west of the Rhine. The Germans also had to surrender 30,000 machine guns, 5,000 cannon, 1,700 planes and all their U-boats. In effect, the entire German capacity to wage war. These were exceptionally harsh terms. Germany had embarked on war, determined to become a world power equal to the British Empire. And in four years of fighting, the German army had never been pushed off French soil. Yet this armistice imposed nothing less than Germany's abject surrender. The question is why? The answer is rooted in earlier events in the war and Germany's first bid for total victory. We need to go back to August 1914, to another train thundering east across Germany through the night. The First World War had just begun. In the west, the Germans had invaded Belgium and France. In the east, France's ally, Tsarist Russia, was invading Germany. Nothing was allowed to get in the train's way. Signals were cleared, points were set, other trains sidelined. On board were two men who would shape Germany's war in 1914 and even more decisively four years later. Germany had gambled on winning the war in a few months. On its western front, a massive right hook through Belgium towards Paris was designed to knock France out of the war. In August 1914, that part of the plan seemed to be going well. But Germany was also fighting on its eastern front, and there the situation was grim. The Russian armies were surging into German territory in East Prussia, and German field commanders had panicked, talking of wholesale retreat. Now, new leaders were needed to save the Reich. One of the men the German Supreme Command had turned to was a veteran of Prussia's great victory against France in 1870. Paul von Hindenburg was retired and in his late 60s, but he was competent, calm and renowned as a die-hard patriot. His aristocratic ancestors were career soldiers. In childhood, his nanny quelled protests with the command, silence, in the ranks. When the call came, Hindenburg unquestioningly got his old blue uniform out of the cupboard. After three years' retirement, it was a rather snug fit, but there was no time to get one made to measure in the new issue Field Grey. Hindenburg was the figurehead to rally the demoralised troops, but the other general on board the train was a very different character. Erich Ludendorff 
was an up-and-coming general who just impressed the German Supreme Command by capturing the Belgian stronghold of Liège. Now, as he nervously rolled breadcrumbs, Ludendorff contemplated new orders. You have a new and difficult task, perhaps even more difficult than that of storming Liège. I know no other man in whom I have such absolute trust. You may yet be able to save the situation in the East. Ludendorff was a complex personality. Meticulous, workaholic and a loner all his life. At school he wouldn't play with other children if it might dirty his shoes. Regularly top of his class as a military cadet, he drove hard, compromised rarely and lived on his nerves. Now Ludendorff was to be the strategist in Germany's war against Russia. He and Hindenburg sped on to the East Prussian town of Marienburg. Here, under the towering medieval castle built by the Teutonic Knights, they took command of the shaken and vastly outnumbered German Eighth Army. Instead of being cowed by the pincer-like approach of two Russian armies, Ludendorff quickly saw the chance of dealing first with the one in the south and then turning on the other army in the north. days. By the end of August 1914, the Russians had been surrounded and destroyed. Their commander wandered off into the forest. His body was found later with a bullet through the head. For the Germans, this success came at exactly the right time. Germany's bid for a decisive victory in the West had been blocked by the French and British. So the German people, now facing a long war, seized on the good news from the East and the Supreme Command hyped it up as a massive triumph. Just a few miles from the battlefield was the hamlet of Tannenberg where in 1410 the Teutonic Knights, some of them Hindenburg's ancestors, had been obliterated by the Slavs. A second battle of Tannenberg, with the tables turned, was then sweet revenge for the Germans. There were awards all round, but it was Hindenburg who became overnight a national icon. His great head, Chiselled face and grandfatherly eyes seen everywhere in newspapers and on posters. He was even depicted as a new Siegfried, the great Wagnerian hero. Yet Tannenberg had been Ludendorff's plan. Privately, he was peeved at what seemed misplaced adulation. Ludendorff's staff began to joke about Hindenburg behind his back. When Colonel Max Hoffman, the principal staff officer, was taking some VIPs around the battlefield, he pointed to a building and said, that is where Hindenburg slept before the Battle of Tannenberg. And later, that is where Hindenburg slept after the Battle of Tannenberg. And that, that gentleman, is where Hindenburg slept all through the Battle of Tannenberg. Yet the snide comment was unfair. Ludendorff was a brilliant military planner, but he fretted obsessively during battles, winding up his staff. It was the stolid Hindenburg who calmed him down, steadied the ship, and then went off to bed. <laughs> 
Ludendorff had a very human side, impulsive and vulnerable. He'd fallen in love in his 40s with a divorcee, Margareta. He'd married her and become a devoted father to three stepsons. As patriotic Germans, the boys all fought in the war for the fatherland. And in time, their fate would be entangled with his. Ludendorff's feverish nerves and Hindenburg's unimaginative calm. Here were the seeds of problems to come. But for the moment, this was a valuable partnership. Ludendorff was the brains, yes, but Hindenburg wasn't just a symbol. He was essential as a rock-solid presence in the frenzy of battle. For two years, this dream team of Ludendorff and Hindenburg won a series of victories against Russia on Germany's eastern front. But none of these battles was decisive because Germany was still concentrating most of its resources on crushing France. During 1915, the Western Front had bogged down into a static war of attrition in the trenches. But in 1916, the Germans once again went for the jugular, seeking the victory that had eluded them so far. They mounted an all-out assault on Verdun, France's most sensitive point. Verdun, on the Meuse River, was a great fortress since the days of Louis XIV. The German Supreme Command was certain France would fight for Verdun. And once committed here, the French, they were sure, could be bled white. The Germans brought up fearsome artillery, more than 1,200 guns, including massive Big Bertha mortars. Codename for the operation was Gericht, place of execution. And it was. France's high command had been astonishingly complacent. They'd ignored signs of a German build-up and failed to strengthen outlying forts. The French were soon reeling. But rather like Ludendorff at Tannenberg, one general turned the crisis around. When the call came to defend Verdun, Philippe Pétain was absent without leave. His aide had to rush to Paris to drag him away from his mistress. Pétain was unconventional. He came from peasant stock and had led at the front by example. This was a soldier's soldier, harrowed by the eyes of men returning from combat, who, said Pétain, stared into space as if transfixed by a vision of terror. This was the human face of war that Ludendorff never saw. He was a ruthless military planner, a behind-the-lines general. Peter, by contrast, understood the frontline realities of death and devastation. Practical and realistic, Pétain reinforced key forts and organised the French artillery into a concentrated system of firepower directed at wherever the Germans attacked. Equally important, he turned the clogged, narrow road that led to Verdun into a meticulously run supply lifeline. But more was needed. To divert German resources from the assault on Verdun, the French demanded that their ally, Britain, launch a major offensive to the north. This was the Battle of the Somme. Sixty thousand British troops were killed or wounded on the opening day. The greatest disaster in the history of the British Army. The battle then dragged on fruitlessly for months, becoming a byword for mindless slaughter. <laughs> 
British commander, Douglas Haig, bore much of the blame. A Duer Scotsman, he was a veteran of Sudan and the Boer War. But on the Western Front, he seemed tied to a plan. It was tactics before troops, rather like Ludendorff. Politicians in London called Haig the Butcher. Yet, for all the criticism, the Somme did serve its purpose. It helped to relieve pressure on the French back at Verdun. There, both sides were now evenly matched in firepower. And the casualty levels became appalling. Around 800,000 French and Germans were killed or wounded. Even more than the Somme, this was the First World War in all its horror. Like the struggle for Stalingrad in the next war, the stakes and the symbolism had become immense. The Battle of Verdun finally ended in December 1916, and it was the Germans who'd been bled to exhaustion. Germany's catastrophic failure at Verdun had far-reaching consequences. It forced a shake-up of the supreme command, the real power in the German Reich. In Germany, there was no civilian war cabinet, as in Britain. Germany had a parliament, the Reichstag, but its powers were severely limited. So as the Reich geared up to fight total war, the military supreme command had become a law unto itself, controlling practically every aspect of German life, economy and administration, propaganda and censorship. It was answerable only to the German monarch, Kaiser Wilhelm II. The Kaiser now made a fateful decision. He turned to Hindenburg and Ludendorff to head the all-powerful supreme command but he did so with reluctance. The Kaiser considered Ludendorff humorless and ambitious, calling him behind his back the Sergeant Major. He also sensed that the terrible twins would undermine his already weakening authority as a leader. But after disaster at Verdun, he had no choice but to give the heroes of Tannenberg command of the whole war effort. In reality, that meant the day-to-day -day control of Germany and its war had been placed in the hands of one man. The Supreme Command ran the show, and the Supreme Command was really run by Ludendorff. The Kaiser and Hindenburg were nominally his superiors, but it was Ludendorff who controlled the detail of the war, from Flanders right down to the Balkans. In all but name, Ludendorff was the dictator of Germany. And he was a dictator searching for a decisive blow to win the war. In January 1917, Ludendorff gambled on an all-out U-boat campaign, hoping to cut off Britain's supply lines. Yet U-boat aggression in the Atlantic brought America, hitherto neutral, into the war against Germany. The USA gradually mobilized all its vast economic resources for the Allied war effort to make the world safe for democracy, in the words of its president, Woodrow Wilson. America's entry into the war tightened the Allied blockade of Germany and its fresh manpower promised in time to decisively tip the balance of forces in Europe against Germany. This was the moment when Ludendorff should probably have sought a compromise peace, but he still hankered after a decisive Tannenberg-style victory in the West. He aimed to make Belgium and northeastern France part of the German Reich. For him, anything less than that would be a defeat. If Germany makes peace without profit, 
then Germany has lost the war. Here, at his headquarters in Spa in Belgium, Ludendorff believed he could still achieve Germany's war aims of becoming a global power to match the British Empire. And he calculated that he had one last opportunity. Ludendorff reasoned that it would take time for the Americans to make their presence felt, because the US was only just starting to train an army. And there was further cause for hope. In 1917, the war in the East was finally bearing fruit. The Russian economy had collapsed, the army was in revolt, and the country disintegrated into revolution. Russia's people had been pushed too far. This sudden collapse of a great power should have served as a warning to Ludendorff, but it simply didn't register. Instead, he saw Russia's revolution as the last chance for a German victory in the West. Ludendorff was able to pull some 40 army divisions out of the East and send them to the Western Front. This gave Germany numerical superiority there for the first time since 1914. He planned to mobilize these forces in a massive push towards Paris. Ludendorff also overhauled German tactics. To spearhead the attack, he created specially trained assault divisions made up of squads of stormtroopers armed with light machine guns and flamethrowers. Ludendorff worked relentlessly around the clock, personally supervising strategy and micromanaging logistics and even training. Ludendorff was outwardly confident, but, as ever, inwardly on edge. Rolling breadcrumbs at dinner, a sign his staff had learnt of savage tension. The civilian is too inclined to think that war is only like the working out of an arithmetical problem with given numbers. It is anything but that. On both sides, it is a case of wrestling with powerful, unknown physical and psychological forces. The only quantity that is known and constant is the will of the leader. This faith in willpower was central to Ludendorff's ideal of command. It was almost an abstract force, indifferent to the bodies and blood that would have to be spent. Already one of his beloved stepsons had died for the fatherland, but Ludendorff mourned in private. As a commander, he was sure that whatever the human cost, Germany's last chance of victory rested entirely on his plan. When asked what would happen if the great offensive failed, Ludendorff glowered, dann muss Deutschland eben zu Grunde gehen. Then Germany will just have to go under. At dawn on the 21st of March 1918, the static trench war of the previous three years would change forever. Ludendorff unleashed Die Kaiserschlacht, the Kaiser's Battle. Unlike earlier offensives, the artillery softening up was short, only five hours, to retain surprise. Then the stormtroops advanced, just behind a carefully calibrated creeping barrage, ready to capture the enemy trenches while their defenders were still under cover. The push along the Somme was a great success, routing the British 5th Army. One British soldier described the experience vividly. They are days of hell let loose, and no time was available for sleep, let alone writing diary. 
Jerry planes were to be seen everywhere, and he gives us no peace at all. We can test every inch of ground. French storm battalions attacked through us, but it was a ghastly failure. They are chased back under the heaviest machine gun barrage that I have ever witnessed. Ludendorff's offensive had suddenly broken the stalemate of the trenches. A young German officer noted the large numbers of British and French prisoners. The British must really have run like rabbits. It appears that the French, who were thrown in to support the British, were brought up from Paris at top speed in motor cars. The first French prisoners whom I speak to ask me anxiously whether it's true that Paris has actually been shelled by guns. Ludendorff appeared to be on the verge of a great victory. The German surge even threatened to split the British army from the French. Haig reflected gloomily in his diary on his biggest crisis since the Somme. The basic principle of cooperation is to keep the two armies in touch. If this is lost and the enemy comes between us, then probably the British will be rounded up and driven into the sea. On March the 26th, the Allied commanders held a crisis meeting here at Doulance. Shells were falling near the town and the atmosphere was close to panic. Pétain was genuinely demoralised. Having fought a major defensive battle at Verdun, he knew how hard it was to stabilise the line once a serious breach had been made. Now it seemed the British army was falling apart and he doubted that Haig had any answers. Haig was under pressure. He knew that many in the war cabinet in London wanted to sack him, and he had little confidence in the French generals, fat tavern keepers, as he once called them. Certainly he'd lost confidence in Pétain, who seemed to him totally defeatist. So the initial exchanges at Doulos were very tense. Haig kept talking about his fifth army. Pétain said it no longer existed. Eventually, a compromise was thrashed out. The British and French would jointly defend the crucial railway junction at Amiens, key to holding their front together. And to coordinate the armies and their bickering commanders, the French general Ferdinand Foch, Pétain's great rival, was appointed commander-in-chief of the Allied forces. This was a vital turning point. It had taken imminent defeat to make the two nations start fighting as one. The Allies finally held the line in sufficient numbers just outside Amiens. But in April, Ludendorff mounted a new assault to the north in Flanders, firing off some 40,000 gas shells. Once again, it threw the Allies into crisis. Haig issued a special order which has become part of British military folklore. There is no other course open to us but to fight it out. Every position must be held to the last man. There must be no retirement. With our backs to the wall and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight on to the end. The safety of our homes and the freedom of mankind alike depend on the conduct of each one of us at this critical moment. In four months, from March to July 1918, Ludendorff mounted five great offensives, completely redrawing the Western Front, which had hardly moved since the end of 1914. At one point, the Germans had come within 60 miles of Paris. Yet each stab westwards was weaker than the one before, 
because Germany was simply running out of men. Of the initial assault strength of 1.4 million soldiers, more than one-fifth were killed, wounded or missing after two weeks. German morale began to crumble. The walls tremble day and night. The place stinks of blood, sweat, urine and wet clothes. The house rings with cries of pain. The number of dead on the lawn of the park steadily increases. In the corner, there is a man digging graves without ceasing. Ludendorff, behind the lines in his headquarters, could not appreciate what was happening to the men. He had no experience of the human cost of his strategy, the blood and mud, the cold and wet, the excrement and rotting bodies. He read of casualty figures with icy composure. War consumes men. That is its nature. Ludendorff's world was one of crisp uniforms and good dinners, a war fought by phone, telegram and dispatches, and marked not by corpses riddled with bullets, but maps filled with coloured pins. But then, catastrophically, for the most powerful man in Germany, the real war suddenly broke through. At the end of March, Ludendorff got into his staff car. He was driven across the old Somme battlefield, through... The two trench systems in which the opponents had faced each other for so long. The impression it made was great. A strip many miles in width. Bleak and devastated. By the roadside, Ludendorff was met by grim-faced officers. They walked across a muddy field toward an open grave marked by a rough wooden cross. Ludendorff leaned forward to read the inscription in English. Here rest two German flying officers. A soldier pointed uneasily to where the exhumed bodies lay, under a tarpaulin. Ludendorff nodded and walked over slowly. A corner of the tarpaulin was pulled back, and he looked down at the face of his dead stepson, Erich. Germany's war leader stood there pathetically, shoulders slumped fighting back the tears. For the first time, Ludendorff was face to face with the intimate suffering of war. This was about flesh and blood, not just grand strategy. He phoned his wife, Margareta, in Berlin. Her eldest son, Franz, had been shot down the previous year. Now Erich, the youngest, was gone and she was totally distraught. Ludendorff told Margareta that her son's features wore a look of peace. That was kind, but implausible. Eric had been dead for a week. His body couldn't have been a pretty sight. Ludendorff had always kept his life in separate compartments. But now his grief as a father began to shake his grip as a general. While he sought the willpower to cope with war's unknown psychological forces, his great offensive was running out of steam. Never have such demands been made on our men's strength of character, morale, and physical endurance as have been made in the last few days. 
brought in over long distances by continuous forced marches in hot weather and without rest. With their numbers depleted, many German soldiers deserted en route to the next suicidal assault. This was a decisive moment for the success of the German war effort. The question was whether Germany's leaders, Ludendorff or his old partner Hindenburg, could see it. Ludendorff's intense inner anguish was becoming more and more apparent. When one staff officer came to his office to warn him about the collapse of troop morale, Ludendorff bawled him out. What is the purpose of your drivel? What do you expect me to do? Make peace at any price? Ludendorff was in deep denial, and there was no one who could make him rethink. Certainly not Hindenburg. His forte was doing what he was told, not thinking outside the box. Confident and patriotic as ever, Hindenburg offered no alternative as Germany lurched towards disaster. It wasn't just the German troops who were losing heart. The home front was seething with discontent because of rising food prices caused by poor harvests and the Allied blockade. Strikes were being whipped up by socialist and communist agitators. And now the Allies, reviving under the command of the breezy and confident Foch, took the offensive. L'édifice commence à craquer, Foch cheerfully told Haig and Pétain. Tout le monde à la bataille. On the 8th of August, the British blasted through the Germans east of Amiens. Tanks were used to crush the barbed wire, and behind them, well-armed assault platoons operated fluidly. 16,000 demoralized Germans simply laid down their arms. The tide had turned. Haig, who'd struggled to cope with trench warfare, was now in his element in this newly mobile conflict, redeeming his reputation as commander. Even cavalry reappeared on the battlefield, ideal for pursuing a retreating enemy. We are being hauled out again. I shudder to think of going through the Somme wilderness for the fourth time. It will be the same all over again, but without any confidence. Our troops will be thinner and worse. Against us, we shall have thousands of tanks, hundreds of thousands of hearty young men, behind whom there will be an American army, which may number a million. Ludendorff was shaken to the core. As a leader, he had willed victory, but his men could not deliver it. The acid of doubt was rotting his confidence. He called August the 8th the Black Day of the German Army. I was told of behavior which I openly confess I should not have thought possible. Whole bodies of our men had surrendered to single troopers or isolated squadrons. Retiring troops, meeting a fresh division going bravely into action, had shouted out things like Black Leg and You're prolonging the war. From this black day, Ludendorff drew a grim conclusion. Our war machine is no longer working. Leadership is like an irresponsible game of chance. The fate of the German nation is too high a stake for me to play. The war must be ended. But how could Ludendorff now end the war? One option was to pull his troops back to fortified rear lines, but that would mean abandoning the territory taken in 1918. And this Ludendorff would not do 
Instead, he insisted the troops must hold all the ground just gained in France, while Germany's diplomats negotiated a favourable peace. It would prove a terrible misjudgment. Germany's war and Ludendorff's mind were falling apart. Ludendorff was now close to breakdown, sometimes in tears. In secret, he kept visiting the grave of his stepson, Eric, whose body had not been taken back to his mother in Berlin. If I didn't send him to you, then that was pure selfishness. I wanted to keep him here. I go to him often. You can rest assured that he is at peace. And it's a lovely feeling to have him here. Ludendorff's worried staff called in a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist, Dr. Hochheimer, persuaded Ludendorff to take a break from his frantic field headquarters and to unwind at a pleasant villa surrounded by rose gardens and parkland. Hochheimer diagnosed a man who was hollowed out with loneliness and chained to his desk. He wanted Ludendorff to learn to speak with a different voice, now a taut, high voice of command to rest his eyes, now completely glazed through continuous scrutiny of maps, to look out onto the mountains, to enjoy wind and clouds, to sing German folk songs upon awakening. By early September, Ludendorff seemed to be improving. Hochheimer noted, the man has really become quite different, fresher, freer, happier. The rigidity went. He became relaxed and personal, asking me about my background and family. My patient improves every day. After deep breathing today, he literally went to sleep under my hands. Such rest and recuperation were not available for Germany's exhausted, ill-fed soldiers, whom Ludendorff had willfully driven again and again into the jaws of death. Now combat battalions were at half strength, deserters roamed the rear areas, and those who remained faced renewed onslaughts. It was Britain and France that now had guns, tanks and supplies in profusion and could fight the kind of mobile war Ludendorff had pioneered in March. And the Americans were coming into the line in strength. In mid-September, they broke through around saint Miel, taking 15,000 more German prisoners. Back at his headquarters, the pressures on Ludendorff returned with a vengeance. The final straw came on September the 28th, when he learned that Bulgaria, one of Germany's key remaining allies, was asking for peace. Some claimed that Ludendorff had a fit, rolling around on the floor. His doctor always denied it. But what is quite clear is that Ludendorff's nerves had finally shredded. At six that evening, Ludendorff left his office in the Hotel Britannique and came down one floor to Hindenburg's room. He told Hindenburg the military situation was untenable and that Germany must ask for an immediate ceasefire, an armistice. On October the 1st, Ludendorff announced his plan to stop the fighting to tearful senior officers. One recalled his grief-stricken face, pale 
but with head held high, truly a beautiful Germanic hero. I could only think of Siegfried with his death wound in the back from Hagen's spear. This was a reference to the tragic finale of Wagner's Goethe Demerol, Twilight of the Gods. And it was entirely apt because a stab in the back would become Ludendorff's swan song. He blamed all of Germany's disasters on the political left, declaring to his staff, Our own army is badly infected with the poison of communist socialist ideas. The troops can no longer be relied upon. Since August the 8th, things have gone downhill rapidly. Ludendorff was claiming that the soldiers at the front had been undermined by treacherous agitators at home. The idea of Germany's betrayal by the left, the undefeated army succumbing to a stab in the back, had been born. In fact, Germany's collapse was largely Ludendorff's fault. He could have tried to end the war from a position of strength in the spring, or retreated to secure lines in August and given his troops respite to hold on into 1919. Instead, he waited till the army was on the back foot and the home front was in revolt, then panicked and blamed the whole collapse on the political left. Desperately trying to retrieve the situation, Ludendorff now hatched an extraordinary new plan. He proposed that Germany appeal over the heads of Britain and France directly to the American president, Woodrow Wilson, who he believed would offer softer peace terms. And he wanted to create a new government in Germany to conduct the negotiations. For years, the Kaiser had resisted demands by the left to grant Germany's Reichstag real power. But now, literally overnight, Ludendorff was proposing that the Kaiser perform a U-turn and make Germany a parliamentary democracy with a civilian government. Ludendorff, of course, didn't have a democratic bone in his body. This was simply cunning realpolitik. He calculated that civilians would get a better deal from the Americans than militaristic autocrats like himself. And equally important, by demanding that the civilians now raise the white flag rather than the army, he aimed to save face, shifting the blame for ending the war away from the Supreme Command. This would be a revolution. Yet in Ludendorff's mind, it would be a revolution from above. A shop window democratization, stage managed by the old elite. But Ludendorff had gambled wrongly in the spring of 1918 on military victory. The question now was whether his political strategy would prove any more effective. The new government was to be headed by Prince Max of Baden, the Kaiser's cousin, a decent, well-meaning liberal, but out of his depth. The new chancellor was deeply shocked at the sudden change in Ludendorff's appraisal of the military situation. Couldn't the army fall back and dig in? Prince Max questioned the wisdom of seeking an immediate armistice. All over the world, it would be regarded as an admission of German defeat. But with his soldiers continuing to retreat, Ludendorff was adamant, bombarding Berlin with messages. I can hold the troops today, but I cannot predict what will happen tomorrow. The army cannot wait another 48 hours. The peace offer has to go out today. As usual, when the chips were down, the Kaiser sided with his generals. When Prince Max asked for his support against requesting an immediate armistice, the Kaiser snapped, the Supreme Command considers it necessary. And you have not been brought here to make difficulties for the Supreme Command. The civilian Democrats had made a Faustian bargain. 
They'd been granted power at last, but their first and most significant act was dictated by Germany's military leaders to ask President Wilson for an armistice. The ensuing exchange of notes between Berlin and Washington was like a game of diplomatic tennis that went on all through October. But Ludendorff hadn't got the measure of the American president. Wilson played a much harder game than he expected. Wilson wasn't interested in a compromise peace. He saw German militarism as the biggest threat to Europe's future. Wilson was a bit of a control freak. He composed the American messages to Germany himself on his own typewriter. The good faith of any discussion would manifestly depend upon the consent of the central powers immediately to withdraw their forces everywhere from invaded territory. So much for Ludendorff's hopes of hanging on to chunks of France and Belgium. Wilson's second note struck an even more damaging blow at the German Reich. Democracy was at the heart of the new world order Wilson envisaged. He now demanded the destruction of every arbitrary power anywhere that can separately, secretly and of its single choice disturb the peace of the world. The power which has hitherto controlled the German nation is of the sort here described. It is within the choice of the German nation to alter it. When the Kaiser received Wilson's note, he was furious, telling an aide, Read it. It aims directly at the overthrow of my house, at the complete overthrow of the institution of monarchy. After Wilson's second note, Ludendorff, instability itself at the heart of the German regime, began to realise the mess he'd got Germany into. All his calculations had gone wrong. The Americans were not delivering the soft peace that he'd expected. Meeting the cabinet in mid-October, Ludendorff insisted that the military situation was no longer disastrous. In fact, he claimed that things were actually looking up with the prospect of extra troops. Once again, Ludendorff had done a sudden about face. If the army can get over the next four weeks and winter begins to come on, we are on safe ground. Ludendorff was raising hopes he dismissed just two weeks earlier. Prince Max and his colleagues listened in angry disbelief, determined now to continue negotiating with Wilson. There was a vast rift opening up between the civilian politicians and the military leaders. This was a power struggle. From now on, Germany would be negotiating not just from a position of weakness, but of internal division. there seems little doubt that Ludendorff's newfound bravado was a bluff. At the front, the German army was disintegrating and the Allied onslaught continued with mounting ferocity. During the five weeks between Germany asking for an armistice and the actual signature, half a million soldiers were killed or wounded, even though both the German and Allied high commands knew that a ceasefire could be imminent. The huge bloodshed can be explained in part by the more open style of warfare. But there were other factors, including the entry of the Americans into the war. Here were fresh troops, a quarter of a million landing in France every month. But in training and tactics, the US Army was still inferior to the British and French, who had learnt the hard way. Often over-exuberant and under-trained, the Americans took disproportionate casualties compared to their more war-weary allies. 
One of the Yanks was a young artillery officer called Harry Truman, shelling this fortified hill near Verdun. The future president's devil-may-care attitude was probably widespread in the American army. It's been two weeks since I've written because I haven't had the chance. They shipped me from school to the front. We went into position right away and fired 500 rounds at them in 36 minutes. Please don't worry about me, because no German shell is made that can hit me. One exploded in 15 feet of me, and I didn't get a scratch. So you can see, I have them beaten there. Not all the Americans were as fortunate. Their losses that autumn were very heavy. The thrust between the River Meuse and the Argonne Forest in late September cost the Americans an estimated 75,000 casualties, some of the worst figures for any army in the war. Those lucky enough to live through it also had to survive a flu pandemic which was sweeping through the military hospitals. Meanwhile, the British Army had become a ruthlessly efficient fighting machine. Whether that was worth the butcher's bill along the way will always be a matter of debate. Just days before the end of the war, Haig recorded in his diary with evident pride a conversation with one of his generals. He finds that our men are fighting better than they have ever done before and are killing more Germans. He has noticed many more Germans dead after battle. Killing more Germans was a deliberate strategy. Still fearful of what Germany might be able to do, the Allies wanted to fight on remorselessly, to weaken the enemy as much as possible and to strengthen their hand at the negotiating table. From Verdun to Flanders, the Germans were driven back in disarray. In Haig's words, We have got the enemy down, and my plan is to go on hitting him as hard as we possibly can till he begs for mercy. The Allied generals still assumed the war would drag on into 1919. They didn't know for certain whether Germany would accept terms and they wanted to ensure that if the fighting resumed, they would come out on top. So, the deaths in those last five weeks, though tragic in human terms, were not without point diplomatically. In late October, the Allied commanders met face to face once again. Foch wanted to gauge their opinions of an armistice. Even now, despite the British victories, Haig was cautious, fearing that the Germans could still offer serious resistance. The British, he said, were short of troops, the French army exhausted, and the American army could not be counted upon for much. The butcher now sounded like a dove. Better not to demand terms that might make the Germans fight on. Foch disagreed, pointing out that the Germans were now retreating along the entire front. And Pétain set out the French plan for a harsh armistice, stripping Germany of its heavy armaments, occupying the left bank of the Rhine and imposing huge reparations. Privately, Pétain was even pleading with Foch to postpone the armistice. Why? Because Pétain had been planning a highly symbolic recapture of the Lorraine region, a coup de grace set for the 14th of November, actually invading German territory with the knockout blow inflicted by the French army, not the snooty British or the cocky Americans. In Washington, 
Wilson was now under intense pressure at home and from his allies to press for what amounted to total German surrender. In his third note, the president told Berlin bluntly that Germany must become a real democracy. If the United States had to deal with the military masters and the monarchical autocrats of Germany, it must demand not peace negotiations, but surrender. The word surrender had the effect of blowing apart the fragile alliance in Germany between the civilians and the military. Ludendorff had never envisaged surrender. He now issued a proclamation to his troops to defy the government he himself had helped create and fight on to the death. Wilson's answer is a demand for unconditional surrender. It is thus unacceptable to us soldiers. And he and Hindenburg raced to Berlin in a last-ditch effort to make the government break off negotiations. Everything they'd fought for since Tannenberg, a Germany dominating Europe, built on a stable hierarchical state, was now in jeopardy. But back in Berlin, Ludendorff had no new arguments to offer, just the stuff from a week before about how the military situation was mysteriously better. This was willful nonsense, and the government took no notice. It was determined to keep talking to Wilson. Then, shouted Ludendorff, in the name of the fatherland, I throw the shame of it on you and all your colleagues. And I warn you that if you let things go on like this, in a few weeks, you will have Bolshevism in this country. Then think of me. There's no point in talking with you any further. We live in totally different worlds. But the Kaiser had stopped taking Ludendorff's side. In a tetchy meeting, he blamed the Supreme Command for losing him the war. Hindenburg now stood by his Kaiser and didn't come to Ludendorff's defence. Ludendorff was isolated. These, said Ludendorff, were some of the bitterest moments of my life. He'd lost the confidence of his emperor and his old ally. It was the end of the road for the Tannenberg twins. Ludendorff tendered his resignation and the Kaiser accepted. The news of Ludendorff's resignation sent further shockwaves through the retreating army, where, in some quarters, Ludendorff was still revered. Ludendorff has gone. That greatest among commanders of armies, the man of iron and energy, has been unceremoniously relieved of his post. Sapped of all willpower, German heroism seems to be sinking into ignominy. In reality, of course, the man of iron and energy was a reckless gambler. Ludendorff had failed to get the armistice he wanted, and then, despite a frantic U-turn, had failed to stop the armistice he didn't want. The arrogance of power, bred by two years as military dictator, had corroded his judgment. For Germany, the consequences of this almost Wagnerian tragedy were dire. Ludendorff had planned to mount a limited revolution from above to head off a full-scale revolution from below. But his attempt at a controlled regime change was backfiring disastrously. For years, Germany had been like a pressure cooker, heated up for war, but with the lid kept tightly shut by autocratic rule. 
Now, people learnt to their amazement after all the propaganda that the war was effectively lost. And at the same time, the autocratic lid was gradually being prized off. Not surprisingly, the steam in the pressure cooker exploded. It started in the port city of Kiel on the North Sea, where German sailors refused point blank to embark on a do-or-die mission against the British Navy. After a tense two-day standoff, the Admiralty rescinded the order for this nautical Goethe Demerol. But it was too late. The mutineers hoisted the red flag and demanded a socialist republic. Within a week, the movement had spread through Germany, even down to Catholic conservative Bavaria. The common demand was for the Kaiser to abdicate. Germany's monarch had gone to the military headquarters at Spa, hoping somehow to rally his troops. On the evening of November the 8th, Prince Max, still struggling on as Chancellor, phoned to tell him bluntly, your abdication has become essential to save Germany from civil war the bloodshed would be laid upon your head. This voluntary sacrifice is necessary to preserve your good name in history. The Kaiser let him finish, then announced, when the armistice is signed, I intend to return to Berlin at the head of my troops. If necessary, I shall fire on the city. The Kaiser had simply lost touch with reality. Like many autocratic monarchs and a few prime ministers, the Kaiser had been cosseted in a cocoon of fawning courtiers cut off from the real world. In fact, the Allies would not sign an armistice if he remained ruler of Germany, and the soldiers, despite their oath of loyalty, would no longer follow him. Next morning, the Kaiser's aides informed him he no longer had an army. On November the 9th, revolution exploded in hitherto safe Berlin. Thousands of workers and their families, unarmed but militant, were marching on the city center. Soldiers were deserting to join them. Prince Max had still not received definite news from the Kaiser at Spa but he decided to jump the gun. He announced that the Kaiser had resolved to abdicate and that the socialists would form a new government. Declaring a republic and giving the socialists power seemed the only way to avert a Bolshevik-style revolution. Next morning, the Kaiser was driven across the border into neutral Holland, where he would spend the rest of his days in exile. He was hardly guiltless, but he alone would become the scapegoat for Ludendorff's misjudgments. The abdication had paved the way for finally signing the armistice, and Germany's total collapse enabled the Allies to turn the screw imposing the punitive terms that Pétain had proposed when hoping to delay peace. In the end, there was no negotiation. Just as the first act of Prince Max's government had been to ask for an armistice, so the first act of the new Socialist Republic was to accept the crushing terms imposed on them. The Germans had fought for a place in the sun as a world power. Now they were humiliated, handing over their empire in East Africa, their vast gains in Russia and their military hardware. For some hours, the Germans haggled over details, but they were now incapable of serious resistance. 
At 5.12 a.m. on the 11th of November, they signed the armistice terms in front of Foch. Ludendorff, the architect of German defeat, was, of course, nowhere to be seen. The senior German delegate tried to salvage some pride. A nation of 70 million suffers but does not die. Foch was not impressed. Premier, he said loftily, anxious to end the meeting and get some sleep. The armistice terms had been negotiated at the very top and in secret. Soldiers in the trenches on both sides were stunned to hear the news. The war is over. How we looked forward to this moment. How we used to picture it as the most splendid event of our lives. And here we are now, humbled, our souls torn and bleeding. Germany has surrendered to the Entente. At 9 a.m., we are staggered to read the news that commencing at 11 a.m. today, an armistice will be in force at Jerry's asking. But the butchery at the front was not finished. Fighting was ordered to continue right up to the 11th hour. Harry Truman recorded that his battery fired its last shot at 10.45. The writer John Buchan reported that officers kept checking their watches. At 2 minutes to 11, he noted, one German machine gunner fired off his ammunition, then was seen to stand up beside his weapon, take off his helmet, bow and walk slowly to the rear. Even so, death still occurred as soldiers lightened the loads to be carried home. I am up forward at the time, and the lads let off all their ammunition, but at a target every time. The artillery too do not mean to be saddled with spare shells, and so right up to the minute of the time fixed for the armistice, they are pumping over shells as fast as they can. Two thousand seven hundred and thirty eight men lost their lives on the last day of the war. On the streets of London, Paris, and New York, there was an outpouring of relief. The French president Clemenceau claimed. Since this morning, I have been kissed by more than 500 girls. The British Prime Minister, Lloyd George, was also caught up in the euphoria. I hope we may say that thus, this fateful morning, came to an end all wars. But in Germany, the atmosphere was very different. There was relief, yes, that the Great War was finally over, but civil war seemed about to begin. So tense was the mood that Ludendorff was persuaded to flee to neutral Scandinavia. Donning a disguise, he had to shove his way through the crowds of radicalised soldiers at the station in Berlin. He travelled unrecognised in second class, a far cry from his epic race across Germany in August 1914. On one level, Ludendorff's plan had badly misfired. He'd lost control of events and the Kaiser had been ousted. But on another level, it had succeeded only too well. The old autocrats had managed to pass the buck. For years, the Germans had been insulated from reality by Ludendorff's military dictatorship. Suddenly, their country and all that they'd fought for had been ripped apart in just a few weeks. And many conservative Germans simply could not reconcile themselves to what had happened. 
Among them was Corporal Adolf Hitler, recovering in hospital after being caught in a British gas attack near Ypres in mid-October. He heard talk of strikes, of ferment in the Navy, but there was nothing specific. And temporarily blinded, he couldn't read the newspapers. On November the 10th, however, the patients were assembled in the hall of the hospital and an elderly pastor, trembling with shock, gave them up-to-date news. The emperor had gone, Germany was a republic, the war had been lost. Everything went black before my eyes. I staggered back to the dormitory, threw myself on the bunk, and buried my burning head in my blanket and pillow. Ever since the day when I had stood at my mother's grave, I had not wept. But now, I could not restrain myself. Was it for this that the German soldiers stood fast in the heat of the sun and the blizzards of winter? Hitler, like millions of Germans, eagerly swallowed Ludendorff's line about the undefeated army stabbed in the back by Marxists at home. Kaiser Wilhelm II was the first German emperor to hold out a conciliatory hand to the leaders of Marxism without suspecting that scoundrels have no honor. While they still held the imperial hand in theirs, their other hand was reaching for the dagger. There is no making pacts with Jews. There can only be the hard either or. Looking back, Hitler saw November 1918 as a turning point in his life. The moment of betrayal that had to be avenged. The armistice proved to be the basic draft of the peace terms. The Treaty of Versailles then filled out the details. Although the harsh peace was followed by economic crisis in Germany, by the mid-1920s the situation seemed to be more stable. France and Germany reached out to each other, signing treaties of friendship brokered by Britain. The war seemed to be receding into memory. Yet the memories on either side were very different. For the British, the Great Memorial was at once abstract and unmissable. The Cenotaph, placed at the heart of government in the middle of Whitehall. From the 11th of November 1919, there began the tradition of two minutes silence, followed by wreath laying. Haig, now a national hero, worked on editing his diaries to put a positive spin on his war. But, to his credit, he also devoted much of his time to ex-servicemen. He was a driving force behind the annual poppy appeal that became a feature of British life. General Ludendorff, meanwhile, threw in his lot with the Nazis joining ex-Corporal Hitler in the abortive Munich Putsch of 1923. Just over a year later, he was the Nazi nominee for president, but came bottom of the list of seven candidates with a derisory 1% of the vote. After a second round of elections, it was Ludendorff's old foil, the perennial frontman Hindenburg, who was elected president. Embittered with Hitler and Hindenburg, Ludendorff retreated into fanatical isolation, writing crank pamphlets against the Jews, the Jesuits and the Masons. His irrational side had now taken full hold. Unlike Britain, Germany's great war memorial was a battlefield, Tannenberg, the spectacular triumph of 1914 on the Eastern Front. And it was unveiled by President Hindenburg on September the 18th, 1927, his 80th birthday. 
The monument looked like a cross between Stonehenge, a Teutonic castle and a Wagnerian set. At its centre was the tomb of 20 unknown German soldiers who died during the battle. When Hindenburg died in 1934, the Tannenberg Memorial was rededicated as his mausoleum. Hitler, now German Chancellor, gave the funeral oration, ending with the words, Dead Commander, enter Valhalla. Under the Nazis, Tannenberg became a monument of German pride, a site for veterans' reunions and a place of pilgrimage for German schoolchildren. It evoked the glories of 1914 that turned to ashes four years later, memorial to a lost victory that had to be redeemed. When Corporal Hitler got his revenge in 1940, France, still devastated by its Pyrrhic victory in 1918, was in no mood to fight. Hitler forced the French to sign the Armistice of 1940 in the very same railway carriage where Germany had been humiliated in 1918. The site had become a great memorial to French victory. Now, a gloating Hitler sat in the chair Foch had used to stare down the German delegates. After the French had capitulated, the Germans systematically blew up the scene of their earlier humiliation. They smashed up the stone marker which read, Here, on the 11th of November 1918, succumbed the criminal pride of the German Reich, vanquished by the free peoples which it tried to enslave. But not everything was destroyed. The Germans left just the statue of Marshal Foch, allowing him, as it were, to preside over a wasteland. Ironically, Foch himself had predicted gravely in 1919, this is not peace, it is an armistice for 20 years. The Germans took the railway carriage back to Berlin as a trophy of war. The carriage we see today is a replica. The original was blown up by the SS in the last weeks of the war. That was also the fate of Tannenberg. In January 1945, as Hitler faced his own Goethe Demerol, he had the memorial blown up to save it from falling into the hands of the Red Army. After the war, some of the stones were used to build the Communist Party headquarters in Warsaw. Warsaw? Yes, indeed. In the carve-up of Germany that followed 1945, most of East Prussia, heartland of the Reich, became part of Poland. For defeat in the Second War, was even more devastating for Germany than the first. Today, virtually nothing of Tannenberg remains, not even the name. Just a few foundation stones here in this field near a Polish town called Olsztynek. The fate of these two memorials, Compiègne destroyed then rebuilt, Tannenberg razed to the ground, reminds us that the 11th of November 1918 was a flawed peace. The problem, I think, with the armistice was that it reflected an imbalance of power in Europe that could not be sustained. It was the product of the total collapse of Germany brought on by Ludendorff's follies. And that's why the armistice was not, as Lloyd George hoped, a peace to end all wars. It was as Foch feared. 
temporary ceasefire in a 